Hello, everyone. This is Steve Berman. I'm here at TylerCon. Unfortunately, our beloved host, Tyler, cannot make it. He is recovering from major dental surgery. So in the meantime, I have a special guest. Adam McComber is here. He's going to talk to us about some writing, his new book, and everything. So let me just ask uh, Adam to share a bit about himself. But first, let me read a description of his new book, Jesus and John. It's a weird reimagining of the New Testament as a novel of allegorical horror. John, a fisherman from a rural village in Galilee, is tasked with protecting the risen body of Jesus, who was crucified on Golgotha for disrupting Roman order in the city of Jerusalem. The body, having miraculously emerged from its cave-like tomb, refuses to speak and walks in a dreamlike silence, disrupting the clear-cut message of the Apostle Peter and eventually leading John on a dangerous pilgrimage to a mysterious mansion in Rome known as the Grey Palace. There, the few inhabitants promise a celebration that may be a sacrifice John is unwilling to make, incorporating Christian Gnosticism, pagan dreams, and a contemporary will towards queer disruption. Adam's new book tells a powerful story of devotion. And this book should be out in May, late May, yes. All right, Adam, please introduce yourselves to, to attendees of this year's TylerCon. Hello, Steve Behrman. Uh, thanks so much for interviewing me, and thanks so much also for publishing Jesus and John. I see you're enjoying a beverage there. I am. <laughs> um, very excited about it. Um, yeah, so I write, um, you know, weird fiction uh, with a, you know, literary bent, um, queer weird fiction. Um, I'm not sure what else to say about myself right now. I live in Los Angeles. I teach at uh, Vermont College of Fine Arts in the Low Res program. Great. So I am drinking right now um, Drum Shambo Gunpowder Irish Gin. Um, I realized as I was pouring my glass, I forgot to add the tonic water. So this is entirely gin right now. Wow, wow that's intense. So, so what do I do? What do I do? Do I... Uh, I look, as, as, a, as a writer, what, what is the solution to this dilemma at my maybe, plot? Just sip it. Maybe just sip it until you can put some uh, tonic in. I don't know. All right. If I die of alcohol poisoning, you know, at the end, oh. you'll... All right, you you know how to to to, to dial to die, dial nine eleven, right? I will, I will. All right, what are you drinking? So it is not unfortunately the the cocktail hour yet in uh, Los Angeles. So uh, I'm drinking water. Um, my cup says crushing it. All right, wait. There's a cocktail hour when we're on a weekend on a Saturday. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Who knows? Oh man. Oh wow. <laughs> Oh, um, you know what? I'm getting an emergency cup. So m while I step away, yep. why don't you tell our audience, um, <laughs> uh, give us your coming out story. I'll miss it, but it'll be great. <laughs> and, I, I went, and you can, you, because I'm not here to censor, you could do any. Wow. So I can just, just, you know, I, I remember reading that, there was, there was a 25-year-old guy and a manatee involved. So oh, yeah. go ahead. I'll be right back. Uh, Steve, okay. Uh, so my coming out story, um, so I'm from a small town in Ohio, small conservative town in Ohio. Um, so, you know, uh, it was not easy to come out. I certainly didn't come out in high school. Um, but I did come out uh, to friends when I was a sophomore in college, and it was great. Um, but I did not come out to my family until years later. Um, and then, you know, the manatee and the 25-year-old guy, they showed up at my door, and I was like, that's amazing, and everything was Scandalous! Yeah. All right. It's fairly obvious I'm not a skilled mixologist at all. All right, great. I assume that was 
incredibly scandalous and it was compelling. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what you like to write. Okay. Um, you have a, you you have uh, a deep seated affection for historical, fantastical fiction. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of anything contemporary of yours that I've that I've read. Almost all of it is 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 this wonderful snippets of 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 history, whether it be Black Plague, Marie Antoinette, uh, Victorian England, and here we have biblical times. So, yeah. what do you what draws you to historical fantasy so much? So, I guess there's a couple things. I like history in that when I write history, it feels more artificial to me when I write about the present day. So I'm really interested in artifice, kind of layers of artifice, um, making the world feel, I guess, less real. Uh, but in doing that to approach something that to me feels even more real. So I do a lot of research with my history, but I'm also interested in um, history as a kind of set piece, you know, to contain, uh, to contain my inventions. Um, that's, that's a big thing for me with writing history. I just like, uh, I also like how ornate I can make things, you know, it doesn't seem quite right to do um, such ornate uh, things with, with modern day writing. Um, I just wrote a short story about a, a modern day pool party some high school students are, uh, are having, and it was very, very plain, um, but it was fun as well. Yeah. Do you mean ornate by, in just um, trappings? Do you mean it by uh, a layering on of, of quirky detail or yeah. what do you, how do you... I think both, right? So I think that it, layering on a, of detail is more exciting to me. I love to fish interesting details out of the past, you know? So not trying to just write, um, you know, something that I've seen in a movie, uh, those kinds of things, but to dig interesting details out of the past. I have a lot of fun with that. What's one of your favorite uh, historical details that many people do not know? Huh. That's a good question. Um, I was interested, you know, for Jesus and John, when I started writing about it, I was going to write about um, the concept of Roman pleasure palaces. So I was writing about this kind of Roman pleasure palace that was set in, in you know, the countryside outside of Rome. And there were going to be lots and lots of rooms uh, in this pleasure palace where um, various historical figures, ancient historical figures would be kind of visiting and having pleasures and maybe traumas as well. <laughs> um, so that I think was a lot of fun, just kind of researching the notion of the pleasure palace and then kind of digging in and, and thinking about historical uh, figures who I could put in that pleasure palace. Do you know about Helio uh, Gabulus? Uh, maybe. Tell me about it. So he's, he's, he's my favorite Roman emperor. I think he's also uh, author Tom Cardamone's uh, fa favorite. He um, was infamous for cross-dressing. Huh? He uh, regularly uh, showed up at um, the Temple of Venus to offer himself as a, as a sacred prostitute. Sure. Uh, and supposedly, supposedly he killed a dinner party by smothering them with a shower, a continuous shower of rose petals. I've read, yes, that I've read about. Yeah, they fall from the ceiling or whatever. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how, how full or wasted these people in the dining room were, you know, to, because I imagine that, that that is a very slow death. To be smothered by rose petals, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Sounds like. I mean, it's possible that, that some, some of the party could have been allergic to rose petals and thus they <laughs> went into immediate anaphylactic shock. <laughs> See, these are the details Like when you're writing historical fiction. You've got to figure that out, right? You've got to figure out all the logistics of things. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to do because you can't find it necessarily in history books. You have to kind of piece it together and, and yeah, figure it out. There you go. So what got you to write, uh, you know, uh, a story about a gay Jesus? I mean, be, I'm, I myself am Jewish, so there's, there's a... A reluctance to to normally even think about 
uh, Christian elements. Mm -hmm. And then also many gay men have suffered, uh, you know, through um, the, the uh, heterophobia of, of a lot of Christianity for centuries and centuries. So is this, is this a, you know, an act of subversion? You know, I'm going to, you know, get, mm -hmm. get these, you know, holy rollers where they, uh, you know, where, where it's most precious to them. Is it, I mean, I know that you, you love about writing the other. You, mm -hmm. you, in all your fiction, and you view gayness as being an other. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, so I, as I was telling in my coming out story when you were getting your cup, uh, I, I, I grew up in a small, conservative, predominantly Christian town in Ohio. Um, so I think partly my Jesus and John book can be seen as, I, I said it was queer feedback for my hometown, uh, you know, that, that uh, or, or like a surreal retort. Um, so that, that's part of it. Um, also, you know, when I was in college, for, for a class in college, we read the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Poggles. Uh, and I just loved that idea. It was so captured my imagination that there were all these other texts floating around out there that were not in the canonical Bible. Um, so I love that. Um, I also love the idea, you know, I didn't make up the idea that Jesus and John were lovers. Um, you know, King James uh, has a, a quote, King James the first has a quote in a letter, you know, he was um, supposedly homosexual as well. Um, he has a quote that says, uh, Christ had his John and I have my George, kind of as a defense uh, <laughs> against what he was doing with uh, George Villiers, who's the Duke of Buckingham. They actually had a secret passage that connected their bedrooms uh, in, in the palace. Um, so, you know, Having read about that, you know, again, I was reading history, uh, kind of ancient history, and just thinking about the people who I could populate my pleasure palace with, and coming across Jesus and John, really thinking about them, they just kind of took over everything. Um, so I think those are all of the elements, maybe, that kind of came together, the vectors that came together to, to make me write about, um, you know, Jesus and John. But it's not just a gay Jesus. This is... You know, I, I don't want to use, even though I'm, I am using it now, the term zombie because it it has a well, it, it has all difference. You know, it it it, it speaks of um, a level of cannibalism that uh, the George Romero has created, uh, and that has overtaken. I mean, he. I mean, your Jesus. This is this is post crucifixion. He, yeah. he is risen, but he is definitely not the same man. Yeah, he, he he's not himself. And I think part of that is, you know, I thought about you know breakups and what that feels like. You know, and John and Jesus they had a relationship prior to you know the crucifixion, uh, and now John, um, you know, the apostle John is kind of following. Or, and, and haunted by, right, this presence of what had been, right? So he's haunted by the past. We get little flickers of, you know, biblical stories and things in the Bible, uh, in, in the book. Um, but yeah, so part of that is just this idea of this absence where there used to be a presence. And that was interesting to me to have, to kind of force John to follow that, that absence. It, it's interesting because... I mean, um, by the way, we're not revealing anything that is not readily apparent, you know, in right. the, the first few pages of the book. So yeah. this is not a spoiler that Jesus is risen. He is not normal. Right. They had a relationship with John. Um, I, I, I think it's fascinating that John literally follows Jesus to Rome. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I mean, it, it's both a sense of devotion that is both emotional, romantic, and, and of course, there is that spiritual component. Yes. 
So, um, and and I wondered as as I was reading it if there's some commentary upon just the relationships of of men. Just uh, really, it could be of anyone, but here we have a case of two men, and obviously one that idolizes the other far more. I mean, um, I'll never forget my my parents my my. My parents, their wisdom about relationship was there's always one person that loves the other more, yeah. and and um, and it's fascinating the power dynamics. And here is a case in your book where you have a power dynamic, but it's a very weird power dynamic because again, Jesus is not the same. So, your thoughts on power dynamics? And, yeah, um, I think that there is. I, I like what you're saying there about kind of the dangers of devotion, right? The dangers of adoration um, that we often in a relationship make the other person into something they are not, right? We kind of layer them um, with things from the imagination and all those things. I, I often write about the dangers of the imagination. Like you think that's a good thing, um, but it can be very, very poisonous, right? Um, so Yes, I think that John, you know, he's struggling here. Like, what is he? You know, what is a disciple? What does that mean to be a disciple when the thing that you follow, again, is now an absence, you know? Um, and, and I do think that connects to the idea of relationships and possibly breakups, having your heart broken, those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, devotion can be a dangerous thing. Yeah. So how long did it take you to write this book? About two years, I would say, um, reading, in terms of the, the research, I had been reading about this kind of stuff for a very long time. I mean, it's one of the things that just interests me. All of my books, they basically come from reading that I've been doing for the past, you know, 20 years. Uh, but actually writing this, about two years. So the interesting thing also is the fantastical elements are not... Um, you know, I'm, I'm not well versed in Gnosticism. So, um, and while you, you, you could have pulled in from various texts that, I think that some of your um, preternatural and, I mean, there is some, there are some horrific scenes mm. seem to come from no mythology that I'm well versed in. And I mean, they're, uh, really unique, and I, I think that they're quite stunning. And I don't want to say anything specific because I don't want to spoil it. But just how did you approach adding the unnatural to this book? Um, so I'm interested in um, the the uh, the psychiatrist uh, Jacques Lacan. Um, notion of the symbolic versus the real. So I was very interested in constructs. Um, I think of, you know, religion itself as a kind of construct. Obviously, society is a construct. Um, so again, without doing any spoilers, we, ha we have an environment here where a lot of uh, John and, and Jesus are confronted with a lot of constructs. But beneath that, there's something that's kind of teeming. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's a reality beneath that, uh, that I think that they're trying to reach. Um, so in terms of how I imagined it, it's hard to explain, you know, how one imagines anything, but I, I think it didn't necessarily come from research. I have this thing I do with my mind where I think of it kind of opening up like a hand almost or like a flower and then I allow whatever wants to come in to come in. <laughs> And so some of those images literally came just from doing that. And then I have to kind of make them logically fit into, uh, into the narrative, uh, which uh, the space, again, this construct inside of the book, you know, it, was, it made itself self available to a variety of those kinds of things. So really, it's just almost opening yourself up to something more cosmic, I guess, and allowing it to, to rain down on you or whatever. Yeah. All right. So let's also just talk about some of your other writing here, yeah. all that. Um, would you, what kind of writer would you say that you are primarily? So I always 
whenever anybody asks me that, I say I'm a horror writer. Uh, I love horror. That's, that's my thing, you know. Uh, I'm so pleased when I'm reading a horror novel or watching a horror movie. Um, I am trying to create a sense of dread in my work. Um, I, I, I have a goal of creating, you know, a, a work that is incredibly frightening as well. Uh, you know, and, and I think sometimes I reach that goal. But so horror and then, you know, a subset of horror being the weird. Uh, I also love the weird. I teach, you know, weird fiction, um, those kinds of things. So, uh, but also that notion of the literary, you know, I, I went to graduate school uh, for creative writing. Uh, my stories in graduate school were often not well received <laughs> because it was story really well received in graduate well, school. Well, that, that is true. Probably no one's. But for me, I kind of had that genre shame, like, oh, you're writing about ghosts? What? You're not doing kitchen sink I, realism? I, I know for a fact that Kit Marlowe's early stories in graduate school were terrible. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess that's how I define myself. So a, a weird horror writer with interests in kind of the literary. Well, that's the next, I mean, I will say that once Jesus and John do get to go, come back to your book, do get back, do go to the Gray Palace. Mm -hmm. It is um, a, uh, the sense of trepidation of something terrible is approaching. Yeah. Um, does, does, mount with every turn of the page which i really did like about that thank you this is not a safe environment and it's and and it's not just the difficulty of leaving it's it's what what they find in there and the questions that are raised and often not answered in fact let's let's talk about that um there are some things that you do not you know you're you're a cruel writer you there, there are some questions that, that you don't seem like you want to, to answer. And I'm, you know, is this just your style or do you, do you have a sadistic <laughs> you know, sense of, of toying with your reader? Right. Well, I think in terms of not answering a question, that was interesting to me. Again, kind of, again, that idea of religion, you know, of, of Christianity or, or really any religion, the idea that you are kind of asking a question, but there's also in religion a kind of leap of faith that has to happen, right? Because no one is going to answer. But in my, you know, vision here, I guess the question almost becomes an echo of itself, right? You can get lost in the question. So it's not that you can have this leap of faith and like, aha, find the answer. It's that, well, the question just keeps echoing and repeating. Um, so we have that, you know, in the rooms of the Great Palace, there is this sense of kind of uh, that echoing of, of, of the question, um, which again, to some degree becomes like, what is real? You know, um, what, is, what is true? Is there truth? Um, so I guess I wanted to put the reader through that a little bit. Uh, I, maybe there is a bit of sadism there. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, um, so why don't you, um, do you have a s specific process when you write? You've written, you've written, I believe it's two short story collections, three novels. This is your third novel? Uh, this is, this is my second novel. Second. So two, two story collections, two novels. Yeah. All right. Um, so, and I know that uh, one short story collection you, you assembled in just the span of like two years. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's first talk, how is writing a short story different from writing a novel? Besides the obvious, does it, does it light up different parts of your brain? Do, do you draw upon different skill sets for your, the, you know, or is, or is it just merely a matter of length? I think that, so when writing my first short story collection, it's called This New and Poisonous Air, um, I discovered the author Isaac Dennison. Uh, is that how you pronounce it, Steve Dennison? I think it is, right? Isaac yeah. Dennison? Yeah. Um, Seven Gothic Tales. And I responded so you know, strongly to the density of her stories, the density of her images. And that, I think, is what really took off in This New and Poisonous Air. I was able to get these kind of complex, 
compact, really dense pieces, you know, art, almost like, you know, pieces of art. Um, with the novel, I do want some density, but I also understand that if you maintain a level of density the whole time, the reader is not going to be able to uh, engage with that, you know, over the course of 200 pages. So, yeah, you, I have to figure out a way to make the story move more quickly, you know, that idea of the three acts, things like that, um, shifts and changes uh, in the plot, surprises, whereas in a short story, I can just give an experience, you know, and I, I like that about the short story as well. But yeah, the novel has to grab you a little more, pull you, pull you through. Very good. I, I adore your short stories. Uh, in fact, I... Um... That's how I became familiar with your work. Um, I, um, I missed a couple of them for my, uh, when I was doing the wild stories, the, yes. the year's best gay special fiction. But yes. I, I did, I, I do remember one of my favorite being the, your pan hook story. Right. Um, I think, uh, why don't you, if you, you wouldn't mind just talking about that one briefly. Yes. Uh, Cause it's yeah. a, it's not the pan you think. No, no, no. It's yeah. So, um, thank you for uh, thank you for putting that in the anthology. That was awesome. Um, I love that anthology. So, it, the idea of pan, uh, you know, a conflation of the great god Pan, uh, you know, um, thinking about Arthur Mackin and all that kind of stuff, uh, and uh, and Peter Pan. I, I conflated the two, and essentially, you know, a, a kind of dying Captain Hook arrives. Uh, at the island um, and is kind of nursed by um, Pan, who is the great god Pan, uh, and is kind of like, essentially dies by the end, right? It's kind of taken over to the other side. So I just, I don't know, I had just had fun playing with those layers of myth and story. In that it, it was great. I love that. Um, it was a way to, to breathe life into something um, that, most people are familiar with and have expectations too. Yeah. And I thought that um, there have been various different incarnations of Hook where, whether it be to redeem him, to further deepen his villainy. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, um, I thought also the queering aspect was really just yeah. well done. It wasn't just, uh, sensationalism for shock value yeah so i really appreciate that um do you see yourself as a gay writer oh definitely yeah i mean that is that's one of my that's one of the parts of my project is to kind of queer these periods in history or queer literature, you know, to queer pre-existing literature, um, to show the queer that is present in the Gothic and the weird uh, and those kinds of things. I love to bring that to the surface, um, allow it to breathe and, and express itself fully. I think that's, you know, definitely what I want to do with my fiction. So, of course, then I have to ask, have you ever had any pushback? As, have you ever had a story that was rejected because of gay content or have you ever had a bad review or someone you know throw uh gin in your face at a reading you know, things like that. well i will tell you that the editor for my first novel the white forest um you know it's published by simon and schuster and it has a it, the main character is a woman uh but it has a gay couple in it and there was a chapter that was entirely about the gay couple and they asked me to take it out. Yeah. Uh, they said, well, it slows the story down, right? Uh, and wink, and wink, that, slows. Huh, what's that, Steve? Wink, wink, slowing the chapter. I mean, but at that point, I was a naive, you know, writer that I was like, oh, wow, you know, I'm so excited to get published and all this stuff. Uh, and, and of course, I didn't think about, well, the, the entire book is quite slow. It's like long descriptions of flowers and things, you know. Um, but I cut the chapter out, you know, and I feel bad about that. I, I did make it into a short story later, and I published the short story, so it exists. Um, it's called Sleep and Death, if you want to read that short story. But it, does, it, it is about the, the gay couple, um, and it is kind of their backstory, um, yeah, so that was one place where, that I can think about where someone did something that I'm like, yeah, that probably wasn't right. 
so when did you, uh, just out of curiosity, at what point did you realize, you know, there may be something, there may be something um, yeah. I, it's less than kosher. On it that. took me a little while, honestly. And maybe, maybe even a year, you know, afterwards, after everything kind of like all the dust kind of settled and things. And I just thought about that and how I liked that story and, and how it did belong in the novel, you know? So again, I published it, but it's not in the novel. Very good. All right. So um, Tyler does have a couple other questions that he wanted me to ask while he's recuperating in the other room. Um, there's something he wanted to ask you about, which uh, about tuna, but I'll skip that. He always, he has an obsession with tuna. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So uh, is there a period of history that you have not yet covered that you just that you've wanted to, but you have not felt that you have the lead in story. And if the answer is no, well, then you can talk about tuna, but. No, <laughs> I do, I mean, I like canned tuna, it's good. Um, I, I have a book about Edwardian ghost hunters that I'm working on uh, that uh, I think is interesting. So I've written, you know, The White Forest is set in the Victorian era. Um, and then, you know, the Edwardian era, you know, uh, is also of interest to me. Um, I do want to really, I really want to write something about Bram Stoker. I'm really interested in him. Um, I don't know if you've read, uh, it's, I think the book is called Something in the Blood. It's a nonfiction uh, book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the queerness of Bram Stoker and the queerness of Dracula has always kind of uh, attracted me. But of course, that would also be Victorian. So uh, maybe I will be returning to the Victorian uh, era soon. Yeah, um, I... I I know that uh, I love um, the queering aspect of um, Dracula. In fact, I, I I edited an anthology of of queering um, characters and Stoker. The whole uh, milieu, we'll say, um, yeah. doing it. Uh, and and I loved uh, my favorite things are of course like how crazy his widow was after he left her with syphilis wow. and she was going blind and she was controlling um, every aspect of the estate yeah. and you know had Nosferatu you know burned in a sense yeah um, that, that is, yeah I also always think about Keanu Reeves and uh, you know. Coppola's movie. I mean, he was so incredibly hot in that, you know, in such a kind of <laughs> a weirdly submissive character, too, right? To Dracula in the castle, yeah. Yeah. Well, but but Harker is he's always submissive. It's he is, he is, he is yeah. and, and you know because he's he's the he's the first victim, so to speak. He is. Um. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what's your favorite Dracula? Then is it is it is it the Francis Ford Coppola. Oh, I mean, I loved that. When I was when I was in high school and I saw that, that that blew me away. Like it's I hate so it. uh, you hate, it? You hate I, it? I hate it. I guess again, because being Jewish, like Christianity doesn't really resonate for me. And so I like, you know, him with the cross. I'm just like, yeah. yeah. You know? I love I guess I love the decadent images of it. You know, it was just so kind of gushing everywhere. Um, yeah. It was it was great because it it was the first movie in a long time that incorporated so much from the book, mm -hmm. which is like you know Dracula being out in the daylight. Yeah. Um, Quincy, his, his little purple sunglasses. Yeah. Yes, yes, and Quincy and 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 uh, other people. Um, in fact, um, the very one of the very first books I ever tried to do, uh, I was working on uh, uh, the origin story for Renfield. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Uh, this was this was back when I was in my early twenties, and I, I was in my first job in in publishing, and uh, boy, did I not know what I was doing, but but. Yes. So let's see. So that's your favorite. I, you know, I think I still like 
um, the Bela Lugosi um, one. Um, no, no, actually, no. It's it's um, now that I think about it, it's the Christopher Lee Peter Cushing one. Ooh, see, I don't even think I've seen that. I need to... What? Huh? Have you ever seen the Hammer? I think it's Horror of Dracula. Okay, no, I haven't seen it. I'll, I'll watch it though. Ah, that's it. Your book is getting canceled. I can't believe oh, it. Oh. This is heresy. It's it's the best, you know, Van Helsing. Oh my gosh. Oh, Call yourself a horror, you know, aficionado. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the picture on the wall? So that is uh, an LA artist uh, and friend of mine, Rebecca Johnson. Uh, and it is a picture she took. Uh, it's very clever. I think she used some kind of like um, just a, a paper towel tube or something and put it in front of the camera and it created that little circle cutout. I'm not sure where it is exactly, but it's a, it's a kind of LA, uh, you know, landscape. All right. You know, if, if, if we sell more copies of Jesus and John, you can't afford like something else on your wall. I mean, I, I, you know, something for over there as well. I just feel like, you know, e even if it's only just one of those, the cat clocks where its eyes go back and forth. I've always wanted one of those actually, but yeah, so far, I, no, no money to buy that, Steve. So let's, let's sell books. That is, uh, do, what, what's your favorite color? Because they make the cat clock in different colors. You know, I think uh, maybe orange or uh, gold. All right, well... Well, you know, after we sell the first, you know, 400, I will buy you that clock. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, uh, man. It may be even a working clock. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So, now, since we have this opportunity, is there just something else that you would like, let's just, just advice that you would like to give for people that want to write um, historical horror? I mean, is there, I mean, I, we already had a panel on, on historical gay fiction, but yeah. I'm- I watched that, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Tyler appreciates that. Yeah. Is, is there any tips that you want to talk about where, because the fear when doing, researching, uh, historical fiction of any sort is the you become so far down the rabbit hole that you lose sight that you should actually be writing and then when you're writing it's how do I not make it seem like you know I'm a tour guide and I'm just showing all the fanciness of the setting I you know yeah. how do how do I make it so that the reader feels there without you know being choked on ordinateness. Yeah, so w one, I mean this, I don't know how interesting this will be, but one thing that I do is I keep a notebook uh, of different um, details that I might need. Um, so, you know, I'll have a page of men's clothes. I'll have a page of, you know, um, uh, flowers and trees. I'll have a page of things that can be inside of a Roman house, you know, and so that I can dip into that notebook whenever I need a detail, but I don't want to info dump details, you know, so I don't pour them all on at once, but I try to scatter them throughout. Uh, and again, those details for me have to feel real and lived. They can't feel again, like something I saw in like a sword and sandals type movie, you know. Um, so that that's a big thing for me is just keeping lists of, of details and dipping into them when when I want them and, and of course they should always serve the story right uh, Janet Burway talks about details should be concrete but they should also be significant they should tell you something about the character or that moment they shouldn't just be in there because you're slathering on details that's an excellent point all right uh, lastly um, just out of you know Many of our viewers um, are are not well as well established as you are in, in their publications. So, um, if you would talk a bit about how uh, you got started in terms of the early writing and submissions, um, and just some, you know, are there? You've done a lot of small but significant markets, and 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 not all of them are what I would consider, in fact, most of them are not what I would consider horror markets. 
yeah. but they've taken horrific stories. So is there a secret marketplace that, that you know, members of our audience should know about? Um, so again, I was trained in literary fiction in graduate school, or, you know, that was kind of forced upon me. Uh, and, and so I think I've always gravitated toward literary magazines, right? Um, I will say that after graduate school, I wrote, I worked on two novels for about seven years, uh, and really nothing came of them. Um, and it was, it was torture for me. I thought, well, I'm going to give up. I'm not going to be a writer. Uh, and then my friend, uh, Brian Leung said, uh, why don't you try short stories again? You're good at writing short stories. So I did, and I started sending them out to small, small magazines, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, and eventually, well, they all got rejected, <laughs> but then one day, two actually got accepted on the same day. And that was such an amazing, like, again, it was like the heavens opened up or something. It was so beautiful. Um, so yeah, that... <sighs> I don't necessarily think there's any secret to that. Again, I do try to keep them uh, at, at literary. I try to keep them psychological, those kinds of things, but uh, I'm just constantly sending stuff out and they, they tend to get picked up um, at this point. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else I need to say about that, but yeah. yeah. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and Tyler and Absentia. Um, it's great. I hope that everyone who's listening will check out your book, Jesus and John. Um, any final remarks that you would like to say? It, hold, hold up the book. Yes, hold up. Yeah, it, 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 the, 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 the yellow circle is, is the arc bubble, what, the advanced reading copy thing that gives you reviewers and all that. But um, the book is up on Amazon, and it is up on the Lethe Press website, and uh, it's uh, it's a great read. If I I'm slightly biased, of course, but 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 totally honest. So thank you, thank you very much. Let's wave to the crowd and take care, everyone. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Oh, hold on, I have to. There we go.